So Rawls' theorem says the following. So suppose, that's a pretty cool theorem, too. I'll explain it graphically. I'll explain like what it means. After I write it down, I'll show you what it actually means, which is really cool. <clears throat> suppose that you have a function, and the first condition is that your function is continuous. So f is continuous. So f is continuous. Continuous on the, the closed interval, a, b, a, b. Oh, you got a haircut, Josh. Yeah, it looks really good. It's good. I didn't recognize you at first. I was like, oh, who's that guy? So, so AB. So AB. It's good. F is continuous on, on AB. So continuous on the closed interval. So if it's not continuous, Rawls does not work. Okay. So like if you had like tangent of x on 0 pi, tangent of x is an asymptote of pi over 2, game over. Right. So we'll, we'll do examples in a minute. 2. F is differentiable, so you can find the derivative of it. On, and this time we look at the open interval, so with parentheses, so a, b, like this. So continuous and differentiable, those are the two main conditions. Three, the y values at the endpoints are the same. So f of a is equal to f of b. f of a is equal to f of b. So if you have these three things, and it's pretty easy to memorize, continuous, differentiable, and then when you plug in these numbers into your function, you need to get the same answer. Like, so they're equal. So if you have these three conditions, then Rawls, which was a person, I think, I'm sure he was, uh, then there exists, exists a number. So a number C in, I believe, the open interval. Yeah, the open interval. ST. Anyone know what ST means? What, what, what is it? If you had to guess. No. S such, such. Such that. Yeah, such that. Such that. The derivative is equal to zero there. So I'm going to explain why. Um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. When I took calculus uh, years ago, I didn't, I didn't understand Rawls' theorem. No. <laughs> no. But I got an A in the test. But it's better to understand. And on your test, you'll have to understand it. Well, you'll have to know the conditions, right? So, but let me give you the idea, like the intuitive idea behind it. And then we'll do some problems. We'll do a bunch of, bunch of examples. It's really a simple idea. So, so here's the y-axis. Here's the x-axis. So this is x. This is y. And I guess we need a and b. So maybe here's a and here's b. So basically, it's saying... Um, where you start, you have to finish, because f of a is equal to f of b. So you have, to, you have to start, if I start here, I have to finish here, right? Because the y values have to be the same height, right? because f of a is equal to f of b. And the function has to be continuous and differentiable, so that's an example. So yeah, okay, so there is a number c in a, b where the derivative is zero. Well, that number would be here because the derivative here is zero, because the slope of the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. So the slope is zero because you have a horizontal tangent line. That's it. So it's basically saying there's somewhere where the derivative is gonna be zero, right? And if you try to break Rawls, you, you can't really break it, right? Let's, let's say we start here and finish here. If you go this way, well, you still have it, right? You still have a derivative equal to zero. There's no way to break it. Uh, what if you try to really break it? Like, what if you're like, you know, I'm sick of Rawls. I can't take it. Let's break it completely. <laughs> Doesn't work, right? There's, how many values of C do you have in this case? Three. There's one here, one here, one here. This just says there exists a number C, so there could be more than one. Right, so you can't break Rawls. Any questions on, on Rawls? Any, uh, any questions at all? If you, if you try this, let's say, what if you do a horizontal line? Then every single number works, right? Every single number works. So there's no way to break Rawls. The differentiability is important. If it wasn't differentiable, you could, you could do this. You could, you could do this. Right? The derivative here is undefined. This breaks Rawls, but not, it doesn't, right? Because it needs to be differentiable. So you can't have that. 
So Rawls says if you have a continuous differentiable function that starts at the same place it finishes, there's going to be a number in between where the derivative is zero. Right? That's all Rawls is saying. That's it. That's all Rawls is. It's a really simple statement. But when you see it like this, it's like, oh my god, continuous differentiable? Yes, Ethan? Are we going to be like, asked where it's zero at? Yeah, so the homework, yes. Good, Ethan. So, yeah, Ethan's asking, are you going to have to find C? In the homework, you'll have to find C on this. On the test, you will not. Okay, so we'll, we'll do some homework problems later. For now, let's, um, for mean value theorem, you'll have to find C. Um, but for Rawls, I'll just ask you if it works. So I'm going to make some up um, because, yeah, like, like, like a test question, test level. So when you're studying for the test, redo this, this example, right? Re, re, you know, redo. So I'm going to put redo because you'll have conceptual questions like this. So the question will say, does Rawls' theorem apply? I always want to say Rollet, but it's not. I mean, we could say Rollet if we want to, but... Isn't it French? Anyone know if Rawls is French? Anyone know? No one speaks French? Oh, okay. Does Rawls' theorem apply? That's the question. If yes, you just say yes. That's it. If no, explain why. So as long as the explanation, I'm really lenient, as long as you say something that's correct, I'll mark it right. It doesn't have to be like the perfect explanation, as long as it's correct. So for example, if it's not continuous at 3, and you say not continuous at 3, that's correct. If you say not continuous on the interval, that's also correct. All right, so. I, I, I don't know. That's a gray area. <laughs> oh, that's, that's all. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe I'd let it go. I mean, it's, yeah. It's February. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's try this one. Um, X squared, negative 2 to 2. x squared, negative 2 to 2. So you basically, you just have to think about the graph. So is x squared, is it continuous, the parabola? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you, if you graph it, it, it looks like this. It does this, right? And then here's 2, here's negative 2. And when you plug in 2, and when you plug in negative 2, what do you get in both cases? 4. 4, yeah. So, so, what is it? Oh, Ethan, you're going to get an A. Yeah, F of A equals F of B. It's so good. I'm going to write it down. So good. So good. It's so good that you understand. Like, I remember taking calculus and, like, not understanding this. Just, I don't know how I made it. I just don't know how I did it. I leave all the word problems blank. So bad. So F of negative 2 is 4. F of 2 is 4. So F of A is equal to F of B. It's continuous. It's differentiable. So on a test, all I expect is the word yes. <laughs> That's it. All you got to do is say yes. Because if I ask you to justify, then it's like what Austin was saying, right? Like how much, how much is enough, right? So just the bare minimum, yes. <laughs> just yes. So if it's yes, just say yes. Okay, B. How about this one? F of x equals absolute value of x, negative 3 to 3. No, why is it no? Oh, it's not differentiable. Good, good. So, so I'll draw the picture. Can't believe you got it. I totally did not expect that. So, so oh, what's the graph of the absolute value function look like? Like a like a v. Yeah, v for value. So, it looks like this. And then if you plug in three and negative three, you get three. Same answer. But it's not differentiable at zero. So I guess if you said not differentiable, Austin, I would let it go. Like, if you don't say, I, I, would, just, I would just be thrilled that, that, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot on the test. I mean, we'll review next time, but I mean, it's so not differentiable. Um, and I'll stick to the condition of Rawls. In Rawls, it was stated like this. That was your A, that was your B. So I'll phrase it that way. Just to stick to the theorem, okay? But you could also say not differentiable. I let it go. Not differentiable at x equals zero. That's also okay. Okay, those are all okay. Everyone see why it's not differentiable? Because the the sharp edge. Okay. 
Yeah, it's undefined there. Yeah, good, good. I can replace this with a cusp. Same problem, right? So if I do this instead, same answer, right? Because the cusp is also not differentiable. That's, the, that's this one. It looks like a little bird. But it's a terrible picture, but yeah, it looks, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, okay. All right, all right. I wonder if I should lead you into it. No. No, let me just... Let, let's just jump into it. Let's like, no, no help. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Just, yeah, okay. Okay. What do you think? No. So it's no. So no. So if you just put no and, you, and, you, and, your, and your explanation is wrong, I'll give you some points. But so it is no. Oh, so the answer here is no. Forgot to put that. Sorry. Um, but why? Right. F of 1 is equal to 1. F of 3 is equal to 3. So f of a is not equal to f of b. You, could, you can just, act, even if you just said f of a not equal to f of b, I'd mark that right. That's happened. It happened last semester. Someone put that, and I'm like, oh, it's good enough, you know. If we also put one, if we also put not differentiable. On this one? Yeah. It would be wrong. But this one is differentiable. Check it out. <sighs> that was the tricky part. So if you graph this, so the absolute value function looks like this, but you only care about this piece. So you're only looking at this piece here. This is a line. You could take the derivative here. There's no problems, right? So here, it's differentiable, right? Because it's just a line. The, the, it's, only, it's only not differentiable at 0. So, mm -hmm. so, that, so the reason is this. Good. You see it? It's tricky, right? That's why it was tricky, because I was hoping someone would say, no, not differentiable. But like, oh, no is right, but it is differentiable. It's only not differentiable here. Remember the sharp edges and cusps? Not differentiable. All right, let's do another one. A, B, C, D. How about this one? F of X equals a trig. People love trig. 10X. 10X. And let's go on zero pi. There's a bunch of answers for this one that, that would be correct. Tangent of X on, on zero, zero pi. So you think it's yes or you think it's no? What do you think? It's no, so no. What's a reason that it's no? Uh, not continuous. continuous. Not continuous, that'll work. Not continuous on zero pi. If you would have said not continuous, I'd mark it right. If you say not differentiable, I gotta mark it right, because it's not differentiable either. Um, let me graph it. So, so it's got an asymptote of pi over two, like this, this beautiful graph. The tangent function is a big deal in calculus too. Here's pi, here's three pi over two, here's negative pi over two. So the tangent function looks like this, it's a terrible graph. So here, there's an asymptote there, right? So it doesn't work. So there's a vertical asymptote at pi over two. And pi over two is between these numbers. So mm -hmm. how hard it will be on an exam um, it'll be like these, right? No worries. You'll be able to. If you go over this example, you'll be you'll get a hundred on this. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah, Ethan. What if the tangent was like in between negative pi over two and pi over two? That's where it is continuous. But it's still no because it's not a b. <clears throat> if it's between uh, negative pi over two and pi, right, it's not a b. You have to have the brackets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to have those endpoints included. Yeah, it's a good, good, good question. E. I wouldn't do that to you though. Because it wouldn't be defined there. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else can we do to make it tricky? I think that's it. Maybe one more. How about... Um, wow, I'm out of ideas. Wow. Wow, I have nothing. Okay, here we go. f of x equals... Let's do... Um, um, running out of ideas. How about x squared, one more, just weak attempt. What do you think? It is differentiable. Right, f of a is not equal to f of b. Right, because if you plug in 1, 
you get one. And if you plug in, that's weird. And if you plug in three, you get nine. So f of one is not equal to f of three. Mm -hmm. so. so these are all conceptual. In the homework, it's multiple choice. And they want you to enter all answers that apply. So like on the tangent one, you would, you would also have to say not differentiable, I believe, in the homework. But then they'll want you to find C if it's yes in the homework. So we'll practice that later. On the test, I will not have you find C on these questions. Why? I don't know. I just, I never do, so I figured why start this semester. You'll have, hmm? Good idea. Yeah, good idea. I know. Why, why make it harder, right? Class is already hard. So for the mean value theorem, you'll have to find C. That's a little bit harder anyways. So let's go to that. But... Uh, any any questions on this one on on this stuff? Think you can do it again on Monday? Right? Is, is it Monday the test? Oh, okay. All right. The good news is after the test we have one day of class, which is actually really hard, 3.4, and and but then you have uh, vacation for a week, right? It's uh, spring break. Wow. Yeah. Did you not know about that? Did you not? Oh, okay. I wanted to deliver the good news, but okay. Yeah, you're welcome. It's always fun to be the person who delivers good news, like you know. Oh my God! Yeah, what is it on two two? No, two 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 three two four two five two six. Two seven two eight. No, there's no two seven. <laughs> two twelve. No. <laughs> and then three one three two three three. Okay, so we have one more. Yeah, yeah. Three four is not on this. Three four is lot. Is rough. Three four is rough. So three four is like the hardest section for for the net, for the third test. The mean value theorem. The mean value theorem. This is a really beautiful theorem. Um, I'll explain what it means too. So for this, you'll just have to find C on the test. I'll just say find C. You won't have to memorize the conditions or anything. I'll just say find C. Uh, this is MVT. I feel like we just did this, but that must have been a dream. Like, did we do this? We, didn't, we haven't done this, right? No. Wow, wow. Did we do another theorem last time? Yes. Oh, extreme value theorem. That's what it was. Okay, okay. I think I was thinking of that when I was going over the extreme value theorem. Like, oh, it's like the mean value theorem. So it says the following. Suppose, so in the homework, you'll have to answer, you'll have to know this for the homework. The first two conditions are the same as Rawls, so it's super easy. So F is continuous on AB. You know, when I really learned this was in advanced calculus. That's when I finally actually understood this. Like, that's how long it took me to understand this theorem. Two, F is differentiable on AB, because you do it in that class as well. If you take that class for fun, if you're a math major, you'll have to take it. So. Are, there, there's, are there math majors in here? Like, just math? Do we have I know. Jordan, you were thinking about it, but no. Are you, didn't you say you were? No, no, no. Maria, you're not a math major? No? Oh, okay. So continuous, differentiable, continuous, differentiable, continuous, differentiable. So then there exists a number C, a number C, and AB such that, let me come over here, <clears throat> ST. Yeah, this is one of the big theorems in calculus. Rawls, mean value, extreme value theorem, intermediate value theorem. There's a lot of big theorems in Calc 1. Calc 2 is a lot more um, computational. Like you do a lot more like integration. That's the opposite of differentiation. This is a much more conceptual course uh, than Calc 2 in my opinion. So such that, so I'm going to write this down then I'll explain it. So I'm going to say it in words as I write it down. The slope of the tangent line at C is equal to the slope of the secant line connecting the points A and B. So F of B minus F of A, and I'll draw a picture and explain it, over B minus A. So this is the slope of tangent line. Tangent line at X equals C, just for, for your own knowledge. And this is the slope of a secant line slope of secant line. I'll let you write down in case you want to, so take your time. I'll give you the picture in a minute too. So there's a number where the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. 
You can also think about it from a physics perspective, from an applied math perspective. The derivative is also called the instantaneous rate of change. This is the average rate of change. So there's a number in the interval where the instantaneous rate of change equals the average rate of change. It's really deep. It's a really deep thing. Um, let me give you the picture so you see it. It's a really easy picture to draw. So here's the idea. There's the y-axis, there's the x-axis. And then here's A and B. And then I'll just draw it like this just to make it look simple. Boom, there's our function. So if you look at the secant line here, this is f of b, this is f of a. And so if you draw a triangle, now I'm thinking of Pythagoras, but we're not using that theorem, you could do rise over run to find this distance here. The rise is f of b minus f of a, f of b minus f of a. The run is b minus a. So the slope of the secant line, I'll just put slope of secant, is rise over run. So it would be f of b, it's really beautiful, minus f of a over b minus a. So that's the average rate of change of the function. So the average rate of change of the function from a to b is the slope of the secant line. That's what we mean by average rate of change. That's how it's defined. And then mean value theorem is saying there's a number c, maybe it's here, where the tangent line is parallel to the secant line. In other words, they have the same slope. So the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. It's really cool. So that's equal to, boom, f prime of c. So it's kind of cool. Um, if you think about Rawls, well, any questions for the next thing is like really cool, the next thing I'm about to say. So, Given a differentiable function, I'll do it again, I'll do it here. Given a function that's continuous and differentiable, if you look at the secant line, there's a number somewhere in the interval where the tangent line is parallel to the secant line. So the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. Any questions on the concept? Does it make sense a little bit? Do you understand it a little bit? Do, any, AC? A little bit? I'll just pick on you because I know your name. Sorry. Are you still feeling better? Are you still sick? Oh, you're good? Okay. I know when you were sick and I went home and in my night class that day, they were talking about the coronavirus. Remember? I know, no, I was thinking like, oh my God, I see you were sick, but she's getting better. It's like, I know, I know, I know, I know you don't have it. I'm just, I know, but Because <laughs> you had the mask on, I'm like, and they were telling me about it. I'm like, oh, people died apparently. So, um, I know. I was going to look at that because, you know, you, you can use differential equations to model viruses and stuff. So, I know I was going to do that Saturday, but then I guess I was going to like mess around with it, but for my DE class. Um, check this out. If f of a is equal to f of b, that's Rawls theorem, then you just get zero. So when f of a is equal to f of b, the derivative is zero. So Rawls theorem is a special case of the mean value theorem. It's the case where f of a is equal to f of b. When I think about Rawls, it's the same thing, except in Rawls you have to do this. Oh, okay. So your secant line is horizontal, so it's the same thing. You actually have to use Rawls' theorem to prove this. Like it's part of the proof. Um, any questions on MBT? Any, everyone, any, everyone, any unclarity on this? Just because it's good to know this. You don't have to know this, but it's good to know it. Like I'm not going to test you on this. Like draw the picture of the mean value theorem. Like if you can go home and you can explain this to your friends, I mean that's it. Like you know calculus. If you can, it's okay. But any, any questions? All right. Let's do a problem. Like right away, test level. Let's do a homework problem. Uh, where we have to find C, something that you might see like on a test. So one that's decent. How about number, wow, there's some really hard ones in the homework. Why? 18, 18 might be a good one. That's the last one in the homework. 18 is an easy one to start with. Let's do 18. So 18 in the homework, they give you the function, uh, f of x equals x to the ninth, okay? So they give you the function. And then they give you the interval, so the interval is 0, 1, okay, interval is 0, 1. Now, I will give you this on the exam because the homework gives it to you, so you do not have to memorize this, okay, it'll be on the test. It'll say, find C guaranteed by the mean value theorem uh, such that, 
So I'll try to remember to put that on the test. I think it's on the old exam too. I have to look. Um, so find C. Guaranteed by MBT. Let me, let me look to see as you write. I'm going to check the old test, see if it's there. Because I think, I think it might be there. Let me look. Calculus 1. This is exam 2. So let's see, did I give it to them? There's a couple of Rawls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be on the test. Good. It will. So you, you won't have to memorize it. Okay. So all you have to do is use this formula and find C. That's all you got to do. So solution. Oh, oh, oh. I guess in the homework, you have to determine does, Rawl, does the mean value theorem apply? Well, it does. Right. That's continuous, differentiable. Uh, there's no problem there. We don't have to do the whole f of a equal f of b. That's only for Rawls. Okay. So we can find the derivative. It's continuous. So we just have to use this formula. So the formula, I'll write it down, is f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. That's the, I'll just write it down so you, so you have it next to the problem. So I like to do this part first because it's easy. So we just have to find the derivative of this. It's the first derivative today. So I'm going to use x. So f prime of x. Ooh, it's been a while since we've done derivatives. Not x to the a. Do you remember? You know calculus. Yeah, you put it in the front. Good. And then you get x to the a. That's it. That's so halfway done. So it's all about using the formula very carefully. It's not hard. None of it really is that bad. The worst stuff, in my opinion, is the quotient rule. That's like. Okay. So no, you had a question. Oh, okay. So now we're going to use this. So our a is 0 and our b is 1. So we do f of 1 minus f of z 0. Look, I'm going to mess up. I haven't made any mistakes today, have I? 1 minus 0. I won't mess up again. I messed up this morning in my other class. f of 1 is 1 to the ninth. So it's 1 minus 0 over 1 minus, isn't that just 1? It's just 1. So that's 1. Because that's, that's 1 minus 0. Everyone see why it's 1? Because 1 to the ninth is 1. 0 to the ninth is, is 0. OK. And then 1 minus, so, you, so you, I skipped a step here. You do get 1 over 1, which is equal to 1. Right? OK, so now we set them equal. You don't have to use c, by the way. You can just use x. So we have 9x to the 8th equal to 1, right? Because this is this, and this is this. You don't have to use c if you don't want to. Then you just have to solve for x. So divide by, by 9. Mm -hmm. So you get x to the 8th. Oh! Hmm. What root do we take to solve for this? The eighth root. Yeah. When you take an even root, you do get a plus or minus. So we do get, so whenever you take an even root and you're dealing with only real numbers, you do get a plus or minus. However, in this example here, which one do we want? The plus or the minus? The plus. The plus. Why? Yeah, good, because of the zero, one. So we only need the plus, and that's it. You don't have to call it C. I usually don't. Um, that's it. So it's really not that bad. This is a good one for your exam because it's not so hard, right? Like the math isn't, it's not like crazy. There's some really nasty ones in the homework. Mm -hmm. We'll do some more now. We're going to keep doing problems. So. Yeah? Do you think the odd root you need plus minus? No, you don't. Good question. So he asked, when you take an odd root, do you need the plus or minus? No. Mm -mm. Yes? If there was, this, if the, <coughs> it feels like the negatives, like negative one to zero, would you do the negative? Yes. Yep. Yes. And if it was like, say it was, say it was negative two to two, well, and then you got that. Then you would do both. You would have got different answers though, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would do both. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's do another one that's kind of like test level. Let's focus on that first because your test is on Monday. Uh, let's see. Hmm. How about um, 
What is going on there? No, no. I think there might be some with, with trig functions that are really scary. We could try one of those. Oh, that doesn't work. So some of them are no in the homework. That's the thing. I want to find one that's yes. Let's see. Nope, can't use that. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Um, let's try running out of ideas. Mm. We could try number 13. Looks pretty bad. Let's try 13. Like, it looks really scary. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, so let's try that. 13. So f of x, I don't think I've ever done this problem in class before, so this will be exciting. Uh, x plus 5 over x minus 3. So x plus 5 over x minus 3. And again, the old exam, this time is really beneficial. Like, if you look at your old exam, and you go, there's one on there, like, it's, it's, it's good. And the interval is negative 8 to 8, and it's MVT, MVT, so phi and C. Phi and C, guaranteed by MVT. Okay, let's do it, solution, solution. So you start by, by writing down the formula, right, the formula, so I'll, I'll write it again. It's F prime of C, equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a, over b minus a. This one looks pretty tough. Uh, I would expect something a little bit easier on your test. I, I try to like tone it down when it comes to some of these things, because uh, usually your derivatives are pretty tough. Like you have like a lot of derivatives with trig functions, and you only have, you know, two hours and 20 minutes, so. We gotta take the derivative of this thing. What rule? Do we, the quotient rule, yeah. So it's good practice, I guess. So let's do it. So f prime of x. So we have to use the, oh, oh. And I guess uh, the mean value theorem, oh, wait a minute, does it even apply in this case? The mean value theorem? No. No, I don't think it applies, right? Right, what's the issue with it? It's yeah, it's not continuous. No wonder I've never done it in class. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, can't use MVT. Right, what how, how, did you, how did you all notice that? What can't you plug in? Three. Yeah, you can't plug in three. Well, I almost lost a point there. So you can't plug in three, right? You can't plug in three, because you get division by zero. So not continuous at x equals three. So can't, so no MVT, no MVT. Can't use it. Right, because if you plug in three, it doesn't work doesn't work. Mm -hmm. No, no. On your exam, it will always work, okay? Yeah, so on the test, I was looking for ones that work. I just didn't, I missed it. I messed up. Um, so, <laughs> so on your test, it will always work. Yeah? If the value in the parentheses that it's, wait, I don't know, it said that was wrong. You have to put both. You also have to put not differentiable in the homework. Okay. Yep. Because if it's not continuous, it's not differentiable. Good. Let's do, I think, uh, definitely, I think uh, 15 will work. So let's do 15. Let's do 15 then. 15 should work. Should work. <laughs> so 15. f of x equals the square root of 4 minus x. This one's a little bit harder too. I think I've done this one before in class. And then uh, negative 21 to 4 is the interval. And again, it's MVT, MVT. Yeah, yeah, we should be okay. The only time there's an issue here, yeah, we're fine, we're fine. So solution. So the question is to find C. Find the value of C guaranteed by MVT. The only possibility that there's an issue, the only issue might be the domain, but in this case, um, you're okay. Do you all know how to find the domain of square root functions? Do you all know how to do that? No, let me show you. Like on the side, if you wanted to find the domain of this function, because you were concerned, what you would do is you take whatever's in the square root and you set it greater than or equal to zero. You don't have to do it, because it's gonna work, but watch. You learn this, I think, in college algebra. You might see it in pre-calc. Whenever you have a root function, Take whatever's that you remember, you see? You do, you were in my class, you remember? 
Ah, you learned something. That's so good. So then you, no, 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 it's good. Yeah. So you add x. Uh, yeah, I, I remember strange things from my algebra class. I don't remember that. So, so plus x plus x. So x is less than or equal to four. So we're okay, right? All the numbers here are less than or equal to four. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got to use the formula. So I'll write the formula down for convenience. F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A over B minus A. It's a good first step if you want to get into the habit of doing it. Before we take this derivative, though, we should write the function a certain way. What exponent should we write this as? One half. One half. Yeah, very good. So a good first step is to write it like that. So 4 minus x to the 1 half, right? The good, good first step. Good first step. And so now we'll take the derivative. We'll use the chain rule here, right? We'll put the 1 half in the front, subtract 1. So f prime of x, this will be 1 half, and then 4 minus x, and then we subtract 1. So it would be negative 1 half, good. Is that it? No. The inside, oh, you remember, times negative one. Yeah, I figured maybe the weekend, you forgot, like, good, good. Yeah, we had, they had the, uh, I don't know if you all know this, they had the, um, that big race this weekend, right? The, the Daytona 500, yeah, it's really, mm -hmm. It didn't happen? They didn't have the race? It's today. What happened to the race? It really, it was? Oh. Wow. I didn't see any rain, but I guess I wasn't there, so. <laughs> I was close. I'm close. I live close to there, like 30 minutes away, so. It's but, really rain here. Really? Rain here? Yeah. What was I doing? Yeah, okay, so that's the derivative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was trying to think, like, how did I notice the rain? Oh, I know what I was doing. Yeah, what, what time did it start raining? Like 5? Like 12. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, where I live, it didn't start raining until like five or six. I remember because I was watching Netflix. Okay. <laughs> Superstore. No, it's on Hulu. Um, so now we have to do this. So we have to do f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So let's see. So f, uh, what's, what's the b in this case? Four. Yeah, four. I should label them. That's her a. So f of four minus f of negative 21 over four. Plus, yeah, see, everyone see why it's plus? Yeah, negative and negative. <laughs> right, it's f of b minus f of a, so it's f of this minus f. Everyone okay with the math here? This came downstairs and became a square root. So it becomes a one half, and then one half turns into a square root. Everyone okay with the negative one? That's from the chain rule. Chain rule. Chain rule. Okay, f of four. So now we're going back to the original to plug this in. So 4 minus 4 uh, is 0. I feel like I should write it. No, it's just 0. You see, everyone see it? 4 minus 4 is 0. Square root of 0 is 0. 4 minus 4 is 0. Square root of, and then this one, I'm, I feel nervous. I'm going to write it. It's 4 plus 21. Right, because when you plug in negative 21 here, it's 4 minus negative 21. So it becomes 4 plus 21. Right, 4 plus 21. So this is equal to negative square root of 25 over 25. So yeah, it'd be negative 5 over 25. So negative 1 fifth. Yep. Negative 1 fifth. Wow, I can't believe they canceled the Daytona 500. That's nuts. I, yeah. yeah, I didn't arrange to like 5 or 6 where I live, so crazy. No, good question. You want me to explain why? Yes, very, super good question. So Josh's question is a really important one that people ask in all classes. People in Calc 3 ask me this all the time. So if you have x squared equals 25, this is an equation. And when you solve this, um, you have two solutions. You have plus and minus 5. Because the equation has two answers. If I plug in 5 and squared, I get 25. If I plug in negative 5 and squared, I get 25. But when you write this symbol, it means what is the positive square root of 25? So it's 5. So it's only when you have the equation and you're taking the square root of a variable that you put the plus or minus. So like if you just have square root of 9, 
that's 3. But if someone says x squared equals 9, well then that's plus or minus 3. Subtle, right? Yeah, yeah, most people don't know that. It's good, good, good question. Good question. All right, so now we're almost there. We just take this and we set it equal to what in this case? Negative 1 over 5. Good, that means you understand. Good, so we have this. Equals, equals negative 1 over 5. Oh, wow, huh? Yeah, <laughs> cross multiply. And we can get rid of the negatives too, right? Because they go away, because negative times negative is positive. So, so 5, that's a 5, it's a fancy 5, equals 2 square root 4 minus x. Yuck, right? What a ridiculous answer. I know, it's really nasty. Yep. I guess now we're looking for x. So we can divide by, by 2, it's a good, good next step, divide by 2, so divide by 2, divide by 2, so we get 5 over 2 equals the square root of 4 minus x, like that, nuts. How do we get rid of the square root? Square it. Yeah, it's really nasty problems. There's some really tough ones in the homework. You'll see after this we're going to do some Rawls ones. Oh, and square this side. So you get 25 over 4, right, because you square each piece. 25 over 4 equals 4 minus x. Wow. Maybe now subtract the 4. When you're subtracting the 4, think of it as 16 over 4. So it'd be 25 over 4. So it'd be 9 fourths. 25 over 4 minus 16 over 4 is 9, is 9 over 4. Is that right? 25 minus 9. This will be 9 over 4 equals negative x. So x is equal to negative 9 over 4. And I hope that's in our interval. I think it is. Yeah, it is. That's yeah, negative and it's not, yeah, it's definitely not smaller than negative 21. So. Should try it. That should be, should be the answer. It feels really like, oh, it's wrong, but that's that's how it is in this section. So, any questions on this stuff? It's not hard. It's just about just. Yeah, I was gonna say it's about memorizing the formula, but you don't have to have it memorized because it's it's given to you. So, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. You think you got this? Think you could? If you had to do this one on the test, you think you could do it again on on Monday? You could. Wait, is it Monday the test? Yeah, Monday, Monday, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it'll probably be easier than this one. Okay, so a little bit easier. Let's go back and do some Rawls theorem questions then. There's one that's really um, a little bit annoying. Let's try, um, hmm, let's do a couple of them. Let's start with number five. Five is probably the worst one in the homework. Let's do it. So number five. I don't want to do it, so we should do it. So five, five. So f of x. Anyone know what the numerator is? X plus six. Oh, numerator, sorry. X squared minus three x minus ten. Minus ten, like that? Yeah. And on the bottom it's x plus six? Yeah. What's uh what's the interval? Um, negative two to five. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Josh. Negative two to five. Whew, this problem is tough. I remember doing this problem for the first time in class without actually doing it, and I got really nervous because the answers were like really crazy. I'm like, oh my god, I'm doing it wrong. And then someone typed it in and it was right, and I felt so good. So find C. So find C. Find C. Uh, guaranteed by, oh, oh. So basically it wants to know if Rawls can apply. So, and if so, find C. So this is a Rawls theorem question. So Rawls applies. If yes, find C. It, it, it should be yes. It should be yes. The only time there's an issue for this function is at what number? Where is there a pos where's the where's the issue in this case? Negative six. Negative six. And that's not here, right? So we're okay. So we can differentiate it and everything is good, it's continuous. So, because if you can differentiate it, it's continuous. Alright, so we just gotta find C. 
So to find C for Rawls, we just take the derivative and set it equal to zero. That's all we have to do in this problem. So what rule uh, should we use for the derivative in this case? What is it? Quotient rule. Yeah, so let's do it. I know I don't like the quotient rule, but let's do it. It's good. F prime of x. Maybe it won't be that long. So it's the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, or first and second. So the derivative of the top is 2x minus 3 times the bottom. So x plus 6. So 2x minus 3, x plus 6 minus the top. So x squared minus 3x minus 10 times the derivative of the bottom piece, which is 1. And then it's all over the bottom one what? Do you remember? Squared. Squared, yeah. You'll probably have one question on your entire exam where you use the quotient rule. Just probably just one. So if you find yourself like doing it three times in the derivative problems, you're working too hard, right? Most of the time, you can simplify stuff. So I'm really aware of what I put on an exam. I don't want you to like spend, you know, to do 10 of these. Like, no, it's just torture. Oh, 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 what do we set it equal to? Zero. Yeah, zero. So, so now we have to actually distribute this. So let's do it. So f prime of x. So let's see. So I guess you can use FOIL. Um, I, just, I, use, I do FOIL, but I just take this and multiply it by these. This, multiply it by these. So 2x times x. 2x squared. That's that times that. So this times this is this. And then this times this is 12x. 12x, 12x, so 2x times x is 2x squared, 2x times 6 is 12x, minus 3x, that's the middle term, so minus 3x, and then minus, minus 18, that would be the last, okay, minus 18. Let's keep going. Now we have these minus sign, this minus sign here is negative 1, so it'll be minus x squared, plus 3x, and then plus 10, thanks. And it's all over x plus 6 squared, and it's equal to 0. So, yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Um, I think this should clean up a little bit. Let's see. F, F prime of x. So the x squared, we get 2x squared minus x squared which is 1x squared, good. And then, oh, the 3x is cancel, right? So we just get 12x, 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 and minus 8. And then we have the x plus 6 squared, and this is equal to 0. I'll pause here, let you catch up, take your time. We have tons of time, I mean. Next time we'll have a lot of time too, except we'll review next time. So, mm -hmm. the worst days were the two five two six day. That was really long. Yeah. That was pretty tough. Anyone finished two six? Anyone? You did, Aaron. Anyone else? Wow, two people. It's amazing. No, it's good. Like, usually nobody does it. Like I've had semesters where nobody does two six. Like no one can finish it. Um, yeah, it's good. Did it take you? I know you emailed me. It took you a while. Did it take you a long time, Neoma, to finish two six? Good. Okay, you have a fraction equal to zero. Set the top equal to zero, very good. So whenever you have a fraction equal to zero, you can automatically set the top piece equal to zero. So you have x squared, x squared um, plus 12x minus eight equals zero. And this is why when I was doing this for the first time ever in class one, once, I got scared because I couldn't factor this in my head. So, so we have a choice. We can use the quadratic formula or we can complete the square. What do you all want to do? 11 to the x plus 6. It goes away. So basically, whenever you have a fraction equal to 0. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. You can think of it like this, too. Like if you have a over b equal to 0, you can always just multiply the whole thing by b. So you do this, and then you just get a equals 0, like that. So the top just becomes, just becomes 0. So same thing here. We're multiplying by x plus 6 squared on both sides. Good. No, ask. So quadratic formula, you want to use that? Okay. So a is 1. B is 12, and then C is negative 8. 
I'll go ahead and write it down. Have we used the quadratic formula in this class? We haven't used it? Oh, we have? Yeah. Do, you know, do you know the song? Oh, I asked the song? So negative b, was it plus or minus square root? It's a terrible song. What goes here? b squared, c all over 2a, yeah. You know there's a cubic formula too? There's a cubic one, it's just really messy and it's not fun, so they don't teach it. Yeah, I don't know it. I, I never learned it. I just, eh, it's whatever. <sighs> yep. And there's one for degree four, quartic. Once you get to five or higher, though, it's been proven that it's impossible to solve all of them. So, yeah, this guy proved it. So b is negative 12. So let's, let's plug it in. So negative 12 plus or minus. 12 squared is 144 minus 4 times 1. And then c is negative 8. It's a little bit tricky. And then 2a, so 2 times 1. You have to be really careful here because you have two negatives, right? And it'll become a positive. It's a really common mistake. I always skip this step, and I never skip this step, mainly because I've messed up so many times here with the a and the c. So this will be a, a 32. So this is negative 12 plus or minus the square root of 176. Yeah, 144 plus 32, 176 over 2. Let's keep going. So you could break it up. So it'll be negative 12 over 2 plus or minus the square root of 176 over 2. You could probably try to simplify that, but my mind is weak. That feels so wrong. 4 to the square root of 11. What is it? 4 to the square root of 11. 4 squared of 11? Yeah. Oh, because it's uh, uh, 44 times 4? Is that, I'll leave it as 176, though. I'll just, I'll just leave it like this. Just, just leave it. <laughs> but thank you. Um, and now we have to check to see which ones are here. So this is where calculators are helpful. In theory, you could do it by hand. Uh, doing it by hand would probably require what Aaron said, though, writing it that way, which is better. But you should check. If you do negative 6 plus... Let's figure out what this is, and then we'll do negative 6 minus, and then figure out what this is. So I'm going to put it in my calculator. So did I bring it? I did. I did. So it has to be between these numbers, right, for us to take it. That's why I'm checking. So negative 6 plus square root 176. I got 0.63. Anyone else get that? Yep, okay, cool. And then negative 6 minus... These answers don't look familiar. It's really frightening. Even though I've done this. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I think, look. Look, look how weird that is, see? They're like... It's kind of weird, isn't it? <laughs> Very similar answers. I think... Uh, oh! Oh! Yeah, so which one? Do we include this one? Uh, no. no, we don't. Yeah, so it's just this one. I thought it was going to be both, and I was wrong. In my mind, I was thinking that. So, someone should try it to see if it if it works. Are you supposed to plug it back in with X's, or it's just that? Hmm. It's just supposed to be point six three, right? It's probably. I would try that. Mhm. Mm see if it works. I'll wait. Any questions on this one? That's correct. That's correct? Oh, good. Thanks. So that's the right answer. Good, good. Kind of a scary problem though, right? When you're doing it on your own. Like imagine if this was on a test, like you're taking the test and you get this, you're like, oh my God, it doesn't factor. You know, uh, you would not have something this difficult, right? That's just, it's just too much. Um, but it's in the homework. Hey, we should do one with the trig function because those are really annoying for people to do. Um, I guess we could try, um, let's try number um, number seven. Number seven is a Rawls question. They give you the question and they say, uh, does, does Rawls apply? And if so, find C. So number seven. Number seven. So it's f of x equals, anyone have number seven there? 
eight, eight sine x like this. Yeah, looks looks good. And uh, what's what's the interval? Zero to two pi. Zero to two pi. Okay. So it does. Rolls. Apply. If yes, find c. So if yes, find c. If yes, find c. Good stuff. So I think Rawls should apply. Um, it's continuous, it's differentiable, and if you plug in both of these numbers, you should get zero, I think. Sine of zero is zero, sine of two pi is zero. So all we have to do is take the derivative and set it equal to um, zero. Right, so let's do it. So f prime of x. Oh, it's been a while. A cosine x. Yeah, a cosine x. There was one in the homework with tangent. I saw it, but it's gonna. It's a no, so we don't have to do it. It's good. I was really happy about that. And we set this equal to zero. Yep, equal to zero. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess we could divide by eight. Divide by 8, so we get cosine x, cosine x equals 0. And so now we have to think about all of the answers between 0 and 2 pi, parentheses, right? So um, we're, we're, we're looking in this interval here. Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, very good. Um, so I'll write them down, and then I'll explain it. Good, good, Logan, very good. So on the unit circle, cosine is the x-coordinate. And sine is the y coordinate. So this is cosine theta, sine theta. And then so here, this is 0, 1, and this is pi over 2. And then here, this is 0, negative 1, and this is 3 pi over 2. So the x coordinate will be 0 at pi over 2 and at 3 pi over 2. So, do you all remember that stuff? Any questions? No question? Oh, no. no Why is parentheses not inclusive? Uh, part of the theorem. Yeah, I, I, I wrote it down because I remembered that. I'm like, oh, what if it's, but it's not, it didn't affect us. But in the theorem, it does have a parenthesis there. So that might affect some of your answers. I don't know. Mm hmm right. Because sine is zero at those, yep. Mm -hmm. um, we can do one like that. You want to try number eight? Number eight might, might bring about that, that concern. Let's do it. It looks kind of scary. I haven't done number eight, I think, ever. So f of x equals uh, cosine of x, and the interval is pi 3 pi. And the question is, does Rawls' theorem apply? And if yes, find the value of c. So I, I think Rawls does apply. I mean, it's continuous and differentiable. If you think about the unit circle, cosine of pi is negative 1. But isn't 3 pi the same thing? Because you go around 2 pi and pi more. So I think we're good. I think, I think Rawls applies. So the answer is yes, it applies. So now we just have to take the derivative and set it equal to 0. What's the uh, derivative of cosine? Do you remember? Negative sine. Yeah, it's got the negative. On the test, we just put yes? Put yeah, on the test, yes. Thank you. So very good question. So Aaron, Aaron's question is really important. And I was going to say it here, but I didn't. I thought it, and I didn't say it. On these questions on your test, it's just going to be either yes, and if it's no, you just explain why. You will not have to find C. The only ones you'll have to find C for are the mean value theorem ones. Okay? And just one, just one of those. Just one. Just one. Just, just one problem. Okay. Set this equal to zero. We can get rid of the negative. So. And then, this is a funny interval. We're between here and 3 pi. So sine is equal to zero. <gasps> Anyone know the answer? Well, it's got to be here. We're looking here. I didn't hear what you said, but we're looking here. So which? 2 pi. And that's it. Right? It'll be 0 here. Because we're, we're going from pi to 3 pi. Yep. So why is it that even if the interval is closed, we use the parentheses? Uh, in the theorem, it says that there exists a number in the open interval. Oh, okay. Yeah, it says a, b parentheses. If you look at the, yeah. So you're always looking for answers in the parentheses. So this is a good example of what Ethan was asking about. Like here you might mess up and type in pi and 3 pi also in the homework. But it's just 2 pi. 
I'm glad we did it. Yeah, that, that's worth it. So, yeah, because it's always A, B when you're looking for your answer. Mm -hmm. um, we should try number nine. It looks like it might be problematic. Let's try it. Let's try it. Number nine. I mean, I usually don't do this many problems, but why not? We got time. Number nine. It's 2020. It's a new decade, right? Like, it's a new, new decade. So f of x equals 8 cosine pi x. Interesting. And then we're on 0, 2 this time. So we're on 0, 2. This is interesting because I think I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you a new technique that you may not remember or maybe you've never seen it. So I think Rawls applies. If you plug in 0, you get cosine of 0, which is... 1. And if you plug in 2, you get cosine of 2 pi, which is also 1. So we just have to take the derivative and set it equal to 0. So Rawls definitely applies, right? Continuous, differentiable. You plug in 0, you get 1. Plug in 2, you get 1. So taking the derivative, so f prime of x. So it's obviously negative sign. So it'll be negative 8 sine pi x times pi. Times pi. What, where's the pi come from? What, what? The chain rule. Yes, it's the best rule in calculus. Yes, I love the chain rule because it doesn't require like foiling or anything. It's just, it just shows up. Divide by negative 8 pi. Yep, so you get sine pi x. Equals 0. Do you all know where pi comes from? by the way? I'll show you after this problem. Oh, you do know? Oh, I'll show you after. I just thought maybe you don't know. I, I mean, I didn't know until a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's deep. Oh, wait, so we have to solve this equation. So I don't know how you all normally do this. Um, whenever I have a trig equation like this and it's not x, I go back to like baby steps. I do the following. I focus on this, okay? x is between zero and two. This is how I teach it in trig. So whenever you have something besides x here, you go back to this. And then you say, OK, you don't have x here. You have pi x. So basically, just take this. This comes from this. And multiply everything by pi. So you get 0 less than or equal to pi x less than or equal to 2 pi. So whenever you have something here that's not x, always write this down and then make this look like this. So like if you had like sine 3x equal to 0, you would do 0 less than or equal to 3x less than or equal to 6. Right? This always works whenever you have a trig equation and it's not x. Okay? So now we're looking for all of the answers between 0 and now it makes it easier. So what are the angles between 0 and 2 pi? Well, oh, it needs to be parentheses on these, but where sine is equal to 0, what would that be? Where, where is sine zero? Pi. pi. It's just going to be pi. It's zero, pi, and two pi, but you have to throw away zero and two pi because remember, it's really this. Right? So this is really this. So it's just going to be pi. So pi x is equal to pi. Right? Because this angle is between zero and two pi. Right? So this angle must be equal to pi. And now you can solve for, for x by dividing by pi, so you get x equals 1. It's really tricky. People in trig have a really hard time with this. I'll go over it again. Any questions on that? So I'll just go over one more time. So we're here, we were here, sine pi x equals 0. And so we know that x is between we know that x is between 0 and 2. Parentheses, right? So you know you, have to know, you know you know you have to make this step because it's not x. If it was just x, you're good. You have pi x. So then you manipulate this to make it look like this. So you multiply by pi. Then you say, OK, what is the angle between 0 and 2 pi where the sine is 0? Well, sine is going to be 0 here and here because it's the y coordinate on the unit circle. So 0 and 2 pi, but you've got to throw those away. So pi is the only one that matters. That means that pi x is equal to pi. So x is equal to 1. 
x. So like if you had, say you had sine x, sine, sine 4x equal to 0 and your interval was 0, 6, the first step would be And then you'd multiply everything by what? Four. By 4. This is a horrible example because we wouldn't be able to do it, but it'd be really hard. But, and then you'd work with that. It's a cool trick. It's a cool trick. Yeah, there's like a whole section in trig on just those types of problems. They cause a lot of issues. Yeah. See, everyone knows where pi comes from? You all know? Do you all know? No. You don't, do you want to see it? Really? Really quick, really quick. I learned this on the internet. My friend taught me in the chat room. Check this out. So this is, so here's the idea. So if you have a circle, there's something, if you measure the outside of the circle, it's called the circumference, 2 pi r. Do you remember that from math? So you can rewrite this as 2 r pi. So what's, what's 2 r? What's that? <laughs> Diameter. So c equals d pi. So what does that mean? So that means if you take a circle, that's your d. So you can solve for pi. So pi is equal to the circumference divided by the diameter. So the cool thing is it doesn't matter what circle it is. It's true for every circle. So I can draw a little baby circle and have a baby diameter and pi is still equal to c over d. Or I can have a big circle and take a big diameter and pi is still equal to c over d. So I if I take a tape measure and I measure this and I divide by this, I'm always going to get this magical number called pi. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? So it doesn't matter. So again, it does not matter. That's why it's so creepy. So again, if I take a little circle or if I take, if I take a big circle, I mean, I, we could do this, right? If we had a tape measure, we could do it. Take a giant circle. You have to draw a really good circle. What's that thing you use to draw circles in math? The compass, remember those? Oh, yeah, yeah, they stick to your legs. They poke you, yeah. The compass, yeah, those things, old school. And you measure this, and you divide it by this, you get the number pi. Weird, right? Isn't that weird? I, don't, I think it's creepy. My friend on the internet taught me that. He used to hang out in this chat room. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know that. I already had a math degree. Like, I already had yeah, a bachelor's in math. I didn't know that. So, so, who didn't know that? Just curious. See, oh, you learned something. That's good, right? Isn't it cool? Doesn't matter. So when people say, oh, pi is so interesting. I think that's why they say it's interesting, because it doesn't matter, right? You know, any circle. Yeah? When I was in high school, um, my math teacher that he showed us, he had us all, or like he drew a circle on the board, and then he gave a string, and it was uh, a radius of that circle he made, and if you do it around the circumference, it's 3.14 times. And he checked it? Yeah. Oh, that's great. What a great teacher. That's so good. It's like a real math teacher. You hear what he said with the, with the, with the, with the string? Mm. So good. Let's take a